Hey everybody, welcome in to another message from Journey Church in Westerville. I'm Pastor Chris, and you can see on the screen, oh no, it's a message on giving. But I feel refreshed and I feel good this week. Last week was camp week for me. I'm a camp pastor at a paintball camp every summer. Took the whole family, loved it, had a great time. Uh, saw some folks that I grew up with that run the camp, and um, I just love being there. It is nourishing to my soul and my spirit, especially coming back to the message uh, that we're on this week. If you have a Bible, turn to Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44, as we continue this study uh, through the gospel of Mark. Now, if you haven't seen any of the other uh, messages in our study through the gospel of Mark, they all stand alone. You're going to be blessed by this one today, even though it's on giving. Uh, it is important. I probably have maybe a different view on it than, than many other pastors or, or yours. So it might be worth listening to, to see what I'm going to say about this passage and how I'm going to bring up some other scripture references, uh, to it, but they all stand alone. If you want to see other messages in this series, uh, teaching through the gospel of Mark, they're all available on our website. And our website is journeywesterville.org, journeywesterville.org. You know, I've been gone for a week. I had to think about it there. Uh, but it's journeywesterville.org. And you will find links there to our Rumble channel, to our YouTube channel, where all those messages are. Also on our website, there's a link to our Facebook page. And you can find out more about where we meet and who we are. And if you have any questions, email me anytime. Uh, I'm chris at journeyme.org. Uh, that's journeyme.org. Okay, so we are in uh, Mark 12, 41 through 44 today. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there. And while you're turning there, I'll give you a little bit of background. In, in Mark chapter 11, uh, we start into the Passion Story, the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. Now, uh, there's a lot more to go in Mark after chapter 11 starts. Roughly 30% or one-third of Mark is dedicated to the final week of Jesus' earthly ministry. Now, that's a big portion. Matter of fact, in all four of the Gospels, uh, 30% of each of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are all uh, wrapped around that final week. Now, the final week of Jesus' earthly ministry, he was teaching the disciples a great deal. He was preparing them for what was going to come next. And he was going through some final trials that were going to be very important for them to watch. Now, in today's passage, you don't hear the, the disciples speak, but you know they're there. Jesus is going to call them over. And throughout uh, the entire last week of Jesus' earthly ministry, they don't really have a much uh, in the way of speaking parts. They have a couple action parts. They go get a donkey. They go find the upper room. Uh, they they do some of the preparation work for the Passover. So we have some of those things, but, but they're not really involved in ministry in the way Jesus is because they can't be. Uh, Jesus is serving and helping. And, and as we've been going through, just to back up from chapter 11 uh, to where we are today, uh, Jesus comes in on Sunday night, he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. As I said, it's when he told the disciples that, that they would find it. They found it. They brought it to him. They went from fishermen to dealing with livestock, which was probably a surprise for them. Uh, this donkey was amazingly controlled by Jesus. It had never been written before, yet he wrote it. And he wrote it into Jerusalem amidst singing and putting down uh, robes on the ground and waving palm branches. It didn't spook the donkey. Because Jesus was in control of the situation. Jesus rode into Jerusalem through the eastern gate on the very day that the, the Passover lamb was to be taken into the home. And, and this is significant. Jesus, the Passover lamb, was coming to be with his people for this week. Because he is going to become that lamb. Now, uh, Jesus rides in Sunday night, Palm Sunday. Monday, he, on his way into Jerusalem, into the temple, he sees a, a fig tree that looks like it's going to have spring figs, but it doesn't. And the disciples hear him out of his disappointment that the tree's not bearing any fruit, curse it. And then he goes into the temple and he finds no fruit there. He is in the uh, outer portion, the, the court of the Gentiles. Uh, when you come in the eastern gate, it would be the, the first court you come into it's two football fields by three football fields uh, multicolored uh, paver stones laid down uh, a very large area but uh, that 
area that Jesus is in on Monday uh, had tables and money exchange and people were using it as a shortcut to go out the Eastern Gate. And Jesus shuts it all down and, and begins to teach there. He begins to restore it to its rightful use. See, the court of the Gentiles was supposed to be a place where people of the world could come in and, and learn about the great God of Israel. But, but they, the Jewish people had made it hard for anybody to come in. They were just buying and selling to their own people in the court of the Gentiles. Now, Jesus cleared the temple and he restored it to its, its rightful state of teaching and encouraging. And the people liked him very much. So that was Monday. Well, then Tuesday on his way in to Jerusalem, the disciples see that tree and it's withered from the roots up. It is rotten. Uh, Jesus cursed it very, very quickly. And then his, uh, the results came very quickly after Jesus' curse that it would never uh, be able to bear fruit again. Uh, and then on Tuesday, Jesus goes into the temple and there are three different planned waves of attack from the leaders in the temple. The, the first one, they try to intimidate Jesus by saying, uh, who gave you uh, the authority to do what you're doing? The second group flattered Jesus, saying, you're a wonderful teacher. We just have one question. Should we pay taxes? To which Jesus said, pay who you owe. If you owe Caesar, pay Caesar. If you owe God, pay God. Now, Jesus hadn't found any faith in the temple at this point. So, so what he's saying here is very important. And then the third group came and, and they mocked Jesus. They told him some story. Uh, the Sadducees told him some story about a woman who had been married seven times. Who would she be married to in heaven? Uh, they were mocking the age to come, which Jesus is in charge of that age to come. And Jesus' upcoming death, three days after this encounter on Tuesday, is going to usher in the beginning of that new age. It, it, it's going to put him in charge of the age to come after the age we're in now. Uh, the time of resurrection, the time of judgment, and the time of eternity is all going to be overseen by Christ himself. But they don't know that. Now, it's interesting to me, too, these three different groups come up in these waves, all trying to get Jesus out of the temple so they can resume their money-making scheme. And, and that's all they were upset about. They wanted business to go on as usual. And Jesus was stopping business and actually ministering to people. Oh, the audacity. And, and, and th this was a tough Tuesday. I think the disciples might have been a little nervous. After seeing what happened with Jesus cursing that fig tree because it wouldn't bear fruit. Now, none of the leaders in the temple were bearing fruit for Christ. They were all trying to push him out. Now, could Jesus have cursed them as he had cursed that fig tree? Yeah. But he is patient. And I want you to know he's answering all of their questions with the truths of Scripture and, and the truth of who he is. He's trying to give them an opportunity to come to him. He's trying to plant seeds so later on they can be saved when he rises from the grave, after he dies for their sins, when Peter preaches that first sermon. And some of them will be. Some of them, their hearts will be cut, and they will ask Peter, how can we be saved? And he'll say, repent, turn to Jesus, be baptized. Well, Jesus is answering their questions, and I, I believe he has a heart for them and wants to bring them across Last week, I, I gave you the, the few verses right before this. And, and there was one young man in, in Mark 12, 28 through 40, who stepped out and came so close. Jesus said, you're so close because he had passion. And he knew that loving the Lord was better th than just doing religious things. That the sacrifice was secondary to truly loving the Lord. That, that not loving the Lord and going through just the motions was empty. It's better to love the Lord. And, and that was in last week's message. I, I love that he was so close. But I want to point out the final verse from, from last week. This is Mark 12, uh, verse 40. Uh, this is where Jesus is talking about the teachers of the law, those that are so arrogant, those that are making money off the temple, those that came to oppose him all day on Tuesday in those three different ways. Jesus says, They devour widows' houses and say long prayers just for show. These will receive harsher punishment. Now, in today's message, we're going to see a widow. We're going to see one of those widows who they devour, who they take their money and give them nothing in return for it. Now, they're going to receive 
harsher punishment. But I want to, I want you to, to be able to see what this widow receives from Christ. She receives his joy. Well, I'm going to read this passage. I'm going to come back and, and talk to you about uh, what giving here means, what Jesus is highlighting, and kind of lay this out in a little more detail that I think will be helpful. And, and I know this is going to bless you today. This is going to be a giving message like you've never heard before. Mark 12, 41 through 44. Sitting across from the temple treasury, Jesus watched how the crowd dropped money into the treasury. Many rich people were putting in large sums, and a poor widow came and dropped two tiny coins worth very little. Summoning his disciples, Jesus said to them, I assure you, this poor widow has put more in than all those giving to the temple treasury. For they all gave out of their surplus, but she gave out of her poverty. And she has put everything she possessed in, all she had to live in or live on. Now, this was something where, where, where Jesus had just to explain where he is he had had these pushbacks all day long in the court of the gentiles but now he moved into a different court further into the temple the next court in and this is the the court of women now the court of women wasn't called the court of women because um only women could be there it, it was called the court of women uh, in the same way that the court of gentiles was called the court of gentiles the Gentiles could not go any further into the temple complex than the court of the Gentiles. As a matter of fact, there were signs up that if the Gentile went further into the temple, it, the penalty was death. Even this court of women, if the Gentiles went into the court of women, they could be killed. So Jewish women alone could go into this area. Now, men could go through this as well. The Jewish men, others going deeper into the temple. But this is called the court of women because it's, it's the, the furthest in the temple that women could go. And it was also where the offering uh, w chest were set up. I, they were called chest. I, I always want to call them trumpets because that's really how they looked if you ever see a picture of one. And, and in the area, in the court of women where Jesus was, there were 13 of them uh, set up. And the first uh, nine were, were all had assigned offerings. So uh, the the... First two, I think, were what was it called? The shekel tax. Um, the third and fourth one were a bird uh, tax, where you could put money in. They would sacrifice a bird for you. It would speed things up uh, because there were so many people. Um, there was a, a wood uh, tax, and one of them where you could put in money uh, there, and it would pay and support the wood uh, used to for fire in the temple. Uh, but there were nine of them that were set offerings like that. I think there was an incense uh, tax in there too. Uh, but the last four were voluntary. And, and these looked like um, a large, almost I think like a tuba really, with, with the fluted end down. Okay, they were bigger than that. But the fluted end down and the small end at top, and, and the small end at the top was open where you could put the change in. And, and if it was, was larger coins, you could hear it rattle. Matter of fact, the very wealthy people would, would have their servants carry in large bags of coins. And they would stand up and pour the bag down into that flute. And, 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 and it would, these were large brass chests uh, fluted out at the bottom. And they were worn smooth, by the way. When people come by, they would touch them. And, and so they were somewhat shiny. And, and so the, the servants would dump that money in and it would make a very loud sound. If you've ever been in a casino, I know it was a pastor. I was there for the buffet. What can I say? But uh, uh, if you've ever been in a casino or Vegas or watched a movie like that, when, when the sirens go off and, and the everything and everybody looks to see what's happened, it, it was like that. It, it was like a... Uh, uh, one of the pull machines suddenly had a large payout and, and, and you could hear that sound of money. And that's what the wealthy people did. And they stood there to get all the adulation they could from the crowd. That's where Jesus was. He, he was in this court of women and he was watching the giving boxes. Now, this is interesting to me. Because he had started off on Tuesday, the, the disciples had seen that withered tree. He came in and, and, and they came in, the, the 
teachers in the temple came at him in waves trying to kick him out trying to make the crowd walk away from him but they only strengthened the the crowd's love and adoration for him because he really is such a wonderful teacher but now he goes into this other court and and I, I want to tell you this is as deep as we see Jesus in the temple in the court of women the court of Gentiles the court of women he he spends this time and we have these moments but uh, man we don't have him any further uh, in any further depth Th- this is actually the last time that we see Jesus in the temple and it's interesting to me w- what is Jesus doing where is he what is he doing he's sitting there people watching now, I'm not much of a people watcher. My wife is a people watcher. When we uh, go to an amusement park or we're different places, a baseball game or whatever, I'll be watching the game or, uh, you know, looking for food in the amusement park, and she'll, she'll be people watching. She finds people's interactions interesting. And, and I mean, sometimes they are, uh, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a bad way. But uh, she's more of a people, and I think it's interesting, Jesus is sitting across from the temple treasury so we know the area he's in uh, where these these the 13 kind of fluted chests are sitting these big brass chests and people would come in and and put the money into them and he's people watching i think it's interesting that 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 the lord loves us you know in psalm 139 david talks about how the lord watches over us and, and knows his every thought and knows when he sleeps and knows where he's going and knows what his future is. The Lord watches over us. And, and, and Jesus, when he was here, took time just to watch the giving at the temple. You know, he had been out in the outer courts and he had found n- no faithfulness, no love for God out there. I um, mean, one, one guy got close. He was almost there. But then they pulled back and they, they stopped asking Jesus question. He, he comes in here and he's, people watching he's he's watching them come and give their gifts and i i think personally he knew those people he knew where the gifts come from he he knew all about them and then the second question i should probably uh, put this up (laughs) where was he and what he's doing he's in this court of women he was watching he was people watching and then Jesus saw something that made him smile. And you heard it in the passage. He, he saw uh, rich people putting in large sums, but that didn't impress him. That didn't make him excited. He saw a poor widow and she came and dropped two tiny coins worth very little. And that's when he summoned his disciples. You know, Matthew says he quickly called them over. In Mark, as we're going through, he summons them and he says, this poor widow has put out more than all those giving the temple treasury. I was inter- I found it interesting when I was going through the Greek on this, the all those giving to the temple treasury, he, he's saying, if you add up everything I saw today being given, she gave more. Now, Jesus is either very incapable of doing good math <laughs> or he's making a point. I, I believe Jesus is making a strong and, and great point here. He's saying what she gave mattered the most to the Father. I mean, isn't that the purpose in giving it to your church at the temple? Is it, wasn't that the, the, the reality? Giving to God. And, and I love this. She, uh, he, he even says, poor widow. Mark says, poor widow. She came and dropped in two tiny coins now the, the greek here they were leptin and the, and leptin means literally to peel and and the the reason leptin is used here for these two tiny coins is is they were so thin they look like they had been shaved off of some other coin you know when you shave uh, 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 something you, you have a little piece of wood or something you shave just a little they would have been very tiny coins matter of fact these coins are one worth one eighth of a penny now we don't need to have something worth one eighth of a penny do we but but they did they, these coins were worth one eighth of a penny and, and if she gave two she gave one fourth of a penny in that offering it's it's called a quadrant and if you think about a quadrant it would be one fourth uh because you you need four pieces to make a whole 
So, so in the Greek here, she puts in a, a, these two leptin, and they equal a quadrant. One-fourth of a penny. Jesus is excited after all that he's seen today, all the, the hundreds of shekels, the people dumping bags of stuff in there and, 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 and standing there in their robes and, and letting people give them accolades. Now there's a woman who has just two little tiny coins that when she dropped them in, wouldn't have made any sound dropping to the bottom. Nobody would have noticed. Nobody would have clapped. Nobody would have looked at her with any kind of adoration. And yet Jesus is excited about this gift. Why is Jesus excited? I think it's pretty clear if you read what Jesus said uh, in Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4 about giving. As Jesus is giving the Beatitudes, he says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of people to be seen by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward for your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be applauded by people. I assure you, they've already got their reward. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, I think this is great. Jesus is actually fulfilling this teaching. He's watching her in secret. There's no awareness by her in this passage that Jesus saw. And and uh, the, I like Jesus' use of, of a trumpet here because when when she puts it into this thing, it looks literally like a trumpet. It doesn't make a loud sound. It doesn't cry out to anybody. Nobody sees it except the Lord himself because Jesus is Lord. And Jesus was watching the giving, but he wasn't watching the giving for how big the gift was. I want you to get this. He was watching the giving to see the heart of the giver. And he is excited not by the amount of giving, by how much out of her heart she gave. Now, percentage-wise, she gave more than others. Percentage-wise. Because he said she gave out of her poverty, where others were giving from their excess wealth. Now, I, I, one, one other thought on this. Jesus saw this, it made him smile. And you can see the third point here. Not one, but two. She had two of these little tiny coins. She would have been giving 50% of everything she had if she dropped one in there. Still would have been pretty impressive, right? She would have given one-eighth of a penny and kept one-eighth of a cent for herself to eat. But rather than food for her body, she wanted comfort for her soul. And she truly loved the Lord. And, and she gave not one coin, but both coins. Now, you might think, but if I gave 50%, you know, everybody should know about that. It's kind of like uh, over the years in the church, I've had people say they're giving something anonymously and then make sure everybody knows that it's an anonymous gift. It doesn't work that way. I do have a good friend one time that tracked me down, gave me something anonymous and made me promise that it would always be anonymous. And it has been. I know this man. He is a good, solid brother in Christ. And I know that giving this was at a cost to him. And giving this, this poor widow, this came at a cost to her. She was choosing between food and, and she was choosing between her love of the Lord. And she clearly chose to love the Lord. It's, it's a powerful moment in Scripture. And, and one of the things as I look throughout Scripture is in the Old Testament, and, and you got to remember, this is still an Old Testament world where Jesus is watching this because he has not died and risen again. They, they're still under the law and they're still uh, under the te teaching of Moses. They, the Mishnah is, are, are some of the things they're following for these different givings, which are, are scribal writings. And, and, and so I looked through the Old Testament a little bit, and, and I found some, some interesting things on the not one but two, on the how we give. In um, Exodus 25, uh, Moses asked the Israelites to begin giving 
to create the ark, to create the, the wilderness tabernacle. And, and by Exodus 36, verses 5 and 6, Moses has to tell people to stop bringing things in. They have too much. I love this because as a pastor, I, in 11 chapters, I, well, I don't know how chapters work, but, but over the course of, of, of a year and 11 chapters here in Exodus, um, th- there's enough and he has to stop them from giving. And later on, uh, Joe Ash in 2 Chronicles 24, 24, encourages the people to give for the temple, for the building of the temple. Ezra later on encourages that, and the people give in both of those to, to build and furnish the temple and, and bring the, uh, the leadership back to the temple after a time uh, of bondage. But then you have Haggai. And I want to read to you a little bit of Haggai. Some people call him Haggai. I, I don't think he'd be upset either way. <laughs> I think he'd be pretty happy to be in Scripture. But the, but the prophet in Haggai 1, 2 through 9, I want to read this to you. What was happening instead of people giving uh, to the upbuilding of the temple in Haggai, the prophet's time? Uh, Haggai 1, 2 through 9, it says, The Lord of hosts says this, The people say, The time has not yet come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. The word of the Lord came through Haggai the prophet. Is it time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now the Lord of hosts says this, think carefully about your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough to be satisfied. You drink, but never have enough, or but never have enough to become drunk. You put on clothes, but never have enough to get warm. The wage earner puts his wages into a bag with a hole in it. The Lord of hosts says this, think carefully about your ways. Go up into the hills and bring down lumber and build the house of the Lord. Then I will be pleased with it and be glorified in it, says the Lord. You expected much, but then amounted to little. When you brought the harvest to your house, I ruined it. Why? This is the declaration of the Lord of hosts. Because my house still lies in ruins. Why, each of you is busy with his own house. My favorite part of this is when Haggai has the word of the Lord. He says, you have a hole in your pocket. You're always just everything you accumulate, you give to yourself. You take for yourself. You say, I need this. I need this. I need this. And you never put the Lord first. And because you never put the Lord first, you, you everything is empty. Everything comes up short because you never put him first. I think it's interesting that, that you, you never have enough to become drunk. Now, it's not something that, that a Christian might say. But, but what the Lord is saying is, in, in, unless you're focused on me, you're never going to find satisfaction, full satisfaction. You can't get none. No, no, no. <laughs> the Lord knows that it's right to put him first. And, and when Jesus sees her give not one of those coins but two, he knows that she is giving at a level where she is putting God first, even above herself. It's a beautiful thing. And I think the prophets of old would have appreciated who she is and what she's giving. I want to tell you three things that that I believe about giving uh, from this passage and overall throughout Scripture. And I'm going to kind of give them to you and, and support them. But uh, and, and we've already kind of covered these. But these, I think, are important for believers to know. Because there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, about giving. So I'll put those up. Three things about giving. Number one, it's not about how much you give. It's how you give, not what you give. How you give. You know, that you've all heard the saying, the, the Lord loves a cheerful giver, right? Well, he really does. He, he wants us to, to love him. Matter of fact, uh, Paul wrote about that. In, in Corinthians, right? In the love chapter, he says, uh, I, I can sing in the, in the voice of angels. That if I have not love, I have nothing. Without love in your heart, the, the gifts are meaningless. I know uh, usually that love chapter in uh, 13, uh, it, it, I read it at weddings, right? I can speak in the tongues of men and angels. I have not love. I have nothing. And, and I know it's true. When I was first dating my wife, there was no cost too great to put on the credit card to buy her things or to take her places or to do things with her. I loved her so much. And over the years, uh, my wife and I, if we've had some 
fights and had some uh, times that were a little rocky, it's because I spent too much on Christmas. I've gone out before and bought a bunch of stuff because I love my family and I love Christmas and I want them to celebrate. I want them to have everything they want and to, to really enjoy it. I, I want my family to have a first class Christmas and I've gotten myself in trouble over it before. But I love them. I love them and I'm fine to go without Christmas and I was fine to go without things when I was first dating wife because I wanted to give her everything. It was passion. It was love. And, th and that's the way I'm fueled. If, if you're my friend at some point, I may just give you something and you may think, well, I didn't get you anything. I just love people. And sometimes I, I do that. And I, I've worked on that over the years to, to bring that back. But, but part of love is that sacrificial desire to give them something great. And if I were to ask you to, to put your uh, credit card receipts next to your giving receipts, who do you love more? I don't know. It's tough. That's tough. A lot of people want me to give a percentage of giving, but Jesus doesn't talk about a percentage here other than she gave 100%. And you have to remember, uh, this is Tuesday in the afternoon, maybe early evening. Uh, three days from now, he's going to be giving 100%. The standard for giving in Scripture is all of you to the Lord. Yet Christians are really happy to put some kind of a percentage on it. We want to go back to the law when the law seems more comfortable than love. But yet in our lives, when I talk about love, that first love, giving to somebody so greatly, and I highlight what Jesus was so excited that he saw here, you know what Jesus is talking about. And it's about how you give, not how much you give or what you give. Somebody can give a, a large amount to the church, but it, if it doesn't cost them anything, was it really sacrificial giving? Was it really giving out of love? Did it really excite Jesus? It should cost you something. Jesus sees her put everything in. He doesn't rush over and say, take some of it back. He doesn't rush over and say, Judas, where are you with the purse? We need to give her a, a couple shekels to get by. Jesus lets her do it and he lets her go and he brings the disciples and talks to them about how wonderful it is to inspire them to give at that level. A level that cost them something. You know, uh, David, there's an interesting story about David in 2 Samuel chapter 24, and I'm just going to gloss over it. You may want to read it. Uh, David in, in 2 Samuel 24 begins to um, count his army because he wants to know how many bodies he has. And it displeases the Lord because the Lord had wanted him to just fight by faith and do things by faith. But David has a sense that he begins counting everybody and it makes the Lord mad. So the Lord gives him a couple different options on what kind of curse. And David says, I, instead of, uh, instead of you allowing man to come in and try me, I would rather be tried by you. And so the, the Lord brings a, a, a curse on, on the people. And then he tells David, you can stop this if you go get some land and, and make a, and build an altar and make a sacrifice there, apologizing for what you've done. So David goes to get some land, and the guy who has the land David wants says, well, I'll just give it to you. And David says in uh, 2 Samuel 24, 24, he says, this has to cost me something. David got it. It had to cost him something or it wasn't really going to show the lord he loved him and he was sorry for going being faithless in dealing with him now the old testament is tough and and jesus is tough here this is a tough week for jesus you know being a believer is not easy understanding giving is not easy but sometimes people do. They equate it down to some easy equation. But Jesus sat there and he watched the people that he had made all day. And then finally he saw something truly great. It wouldn't have been great in anybody else's eyes but him. Because anybody else would have said that's such a meaningless amount. That won't do anything in the temple. But Jesus is excited because he saw faith doing something in her. It cost her something. I want to read to you uh, something by C.S. Lewis. This is from Mere Christianity, one of my favorite books to read through. Now, it's it's not scripture, 
but I think it defines this well. Uh, This is C.S. Lewis on giving from Mere Christianity. He says, I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I am afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc., is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we are probably giving way too little. If our charities do not all pinch or hamper us, I should say they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditures exclude them. That's powerful. And and that's what Jesus saw here, her, her giving, her charitable giving. And, and, and I read to you verse 40 right before this, where, where Jesus says, woe to you, those who devour widows' homes, right? He's talking to the chief priests, the, the people that will take this money. Now, they're going to be under harsher judgment, but she's going to escape judgment because she's being faithful. I've had people say, well, I don't give to the church because look at what this church over here did, or this pastor bought a jet, or this church did. Listen. You need to be faithful to what you're faithful to. They'll be judged on what they're faithful to. I, I can tell you this. If, if you give at Journey, what Journey does is I teach the Word of God week after week after week. I want you to love Him, and I, I that's how I teach God's Word. I love Him. I want you to love Jesus. I want you to be respectful of Jesus. I want you to grow in your faith of Jesus. That's what we do. And, and I believe if you're inspired to love Jesus, then the gifts will come. I don't have to teach on giving. Now, today we're in a passage that's on giving, so I'm teaching on it. But I only teach on giving when we get to the passage that teaches on it. I don't bring it up at other times or wrap around other things or jump into it in a special series because money is down or, or whatever. And, and I've been around those ministries that they have a building campaign or something they need or they're crying or bleeding for money all the time. Once you have that pledge drive and you, you tell people you need it, then, then you keep going. And if God needed money, then, then we could stop all of the ministry and, and just do telethons all the time to get all the money. But here's the other thing. The third thing you can see up there is the Lord doesn't need your help. The Lord owns the sheep of uh, all the hills, the thousand hills. He he doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our money. I, I've had the opportunity, a uh, sad opportunity, a journey a few times to refuse money because it came with strings. And I've told people when we were starting out, I had somebody offer me a, a large amount of money, but we had to start a, a certain program that they wanted us to start. And I, I did not want to be a program church. I wanted to be a teaching church. And it was hard to see that go because we needed those funds, but I hit my knees and just prayed. And, and every time I pray and I'm faithful to do what I do, God works in the hearts of people and, and supplies what is needed. And Journey never gets ahead of itself with big campaigns to do things. We do the things God has already funded us to do. That's different. I told you it's going to be a little different today. I I don't believe the Lord needs our help. And and we live in a world that throws money at everything to fix it. Spiritual things aren't always fixed with money. This woman was doing something special. Jesus saw her, and on a tough day and a tough week, this made Jesus smile. She made the Lord happy because he saw faithfulness for the first time that day in the temple. He saw somebody truly loving the Lord and giving to the Lord first and putting the Lord first. And that's what our giving should be. Not figuring out how much we need and giving God the leftover, giving to the Lord. And then knowing that he will take care of us out of his abundance. Because he doesn't need our help. I've had that to say to people before, if they want a plaque on something or be remembered for something, our church doesn't do that. We're not going to put up some kind of marker or plaque with anyone's name on it. Because there's only one name above every name that our church worships and that we preach about, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't make any other shrines. Giving costs us something. And it should be done without anyone knowing. So how could there be a name attached? You know, Paul saw this in full action. 
In 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 7, Paul writes about this same thing. If you're wondering if the disciples continued this on to the early church, uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 7, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God granted to the churches of Macedonia. During a severe testing by affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed into the wealth of their generosity. I testify that to their own according to their ability and beyond their ability, they begged us insistently for the privilege of sharing in the ministry to the saints. And not just as we hoped, instead they gave themselves especially to the Lord, then to us by God's will. So we urged Titus that just as he had begun, so he should also complete this grace to you. Now, as you excel in everything, faith, speech, knowledge, and in all diligence, and in our love for us, excel also in this grace. Uh, Paul is saying, listen, the, these folks at this church, they wanted to give, and they didn't have much, and they were being afflicted, but they they wanted to give to ministry, and they begged us to give to ministry, and they gave more than we ever thought they could give. Because they wanted to be involved in it, and they felt the Lord pulling at their hearts. The Lord doesn't need you But you need him and, and you can grow in your faith. You know, it's, it's one of those things that the Lord doesn't need your help, but he's not trying to raise funds. He's trying to raise children and as children become generous to the Lord and give back to him and trust him. We grow. The Lord's not in need. We are. And our biggest need is to learn to let go of things that we think we need and find out we really didn't need them after all. You didn't need certain things. And it's better to make those sacrifices and give them first to the Lord. I, I This passage is a powerful passage to me. And, and it's the way I've, I've tried to live my life. It's the way I want to encourage our church. I want people to love the Lord. Because if you love him, you'll give. And then you'll be blessed because you're a part of uh, not just the, some people talk about the cycle of getting and then you get something. It's not about giving and getting. He wants to give to you anyway. It's about giving and giving up things and then realizing you didn't need them so you can become more mature in Christ and more on the mission of Christ and less worldly. I want to read to you something here on close and I, I i enjoy this a great deal it's written by a guy named kent Hughes. he's a, a well-known theologian i enjoy some of the things he wrote or he is written or writes <laughs> figure that out but anyway he he wrote this it's called uh cirrhosis of the giver and so i'd like to read this to you um to close and, and Kent Hughes writes, There is a disease which is particularly virulent, virulent in this part of the 20th century. It is called cirrhosis of the giver. It was actually discovered about 34 AD and ran a terminal course in a couple named Ananias and Sapphira. It is an acute condition which renders the patient's hand immobile when it attempts to move from the billfold to the offering plate. The remedy is to remove the afflicted from the house of God, since it is clinically observable that this condition disappears in alternate environments such as golf courses or clubs or restaurants. Actually, the disease is really not a motor problem, but a heart problem. The best remedy is to fall in love with God with all your heart, for where your heart is, there your treasure will also be. I think that's beautiful. And, and it's true. Whatever you love, whatever you truly love, is where your money will go. This woman truly loved Jesus. And on a week where Jesus needed some encouragement in the temple, I think her heart provided that encouragement that Jesus finally saw something faithful in the temple. And it wasn't a man, it wasn't a scribe, and it wasn't somebody learned, and it wasn't somebody rich, and it wasn't somebody important. It was a nobody by their standards of that day. Now, not a nobody to Jesus. But it was somebody poor who had so little to give. But to Jesus, that was everything. Because she gave that having to trust in the Lord. She was growing. She was faithful and no one else was. And Jesus called his disciples over to show them and, and to encourage them so they could be like that too. 
Instead of out for money, serving the almighty dollar, they served Jesus and they were true to Jesus. And when that money came in, they put it right back into the plate. They put it right back into the church for the building up of the church in any way they could and the ministry to those in need any way they could. This wasn't about money. This is about maturity and faith. This is about seeing something spiritual over seeing things of the world. As I close, I want to tell you one more story. When I was a kid and, and my mom would drop me off of church or take me to church, I, I had there, there were a couple older ladies in the church, Hazel Hawk and my, my, my uh, grandma. She wasn't really my grandma, but we called her Grandma Margie. In that Sunday school in that church, in that nursery. As I grew up over the years, those older ladies really encouraged me, taught me all the Bible studies more than the pastor. I remember them building things into to young Christopher's life and encouraging me. My grandma Kinner was a, 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 a great encouragement to me as well. She would, when it, when the rest of the world would be down on me, my grandma Kinner would say, Christopher, you're the best. And somebody would say, Chris did this and that. She would say, Oh, not my Christopher. And she believed me and encouraged me. And, and, and she helped me to learn some Latin when I was uh, in, in college, uh, staying with them and, and, and stayed up with me sometimes when I was studying Th those older ladies in our church that my grandmother and then now at our church at journey we have several older ladies who who come and, and they're such an encouragement to me and i see them at, at our church we don't pass a plate we, we have a giving box when you come in similar to what jesus saw in the temple and and i think it's a believer's responsibility to give and and when people come to me and say when are you going to take an offering i say we, we never will we don't take time from that in the service that is the responsibility of those who love christ so go find the box or mail in a check but but you have to do a little extra work maybe because I don't want it to be a competition whose hands are moving through the plate. I, I want only the Lord to see it. And I want the Lord to, to be encouraged by it. But sometimes coming in on Sunday morning, I'll see those ladies go by the box. And I know they, they, they live in, in a rent-controlled place and, and they may not have a lot of money. But I, I love this passage that we've gone through together today. Because somebody who didn't have much gave... And that was important to the Lord. I bet if you ask Grandma Marjorie or Hazel Hawk, my Sunday school teachers, I bet if you ask my grandma, I bet if you ask those older ladies at our church, they would say, we don't have much, we don't have much. But listen, you have heart. And you've given me incredible encouragement over the years, ladies. And I don't know if any of you will watch this, but but I want to let you know, if, if you're watching this, call your grandma, call maybe that older lady. Think about this passage, but also think about a truly giving heart that loves other people, that loves the Lord so much and wants to give. Is your giving anything like that? Or do you have cirrhosis? of the giver are you keeping and holding back always something for yourself instead of releasing in love to the lord everything you have oh no it's a message on giving and double them no chris didn't stop at a percentage point he followed jesus and jesus was in joy because this woman this old widow gave everything she had it was nothing to the world but it was everything for christ is your little bit that you've been holding back is your little bit you've been holding back worth it to hold back or can you love the lord and grow let's pray dear heavenly father i thank you for those that have watched this video this is a tough one and i'm probably going to get some blowback on it but when i look at this passage and i look around scripture i, I don't see jesus making it easy I see Jesus compelling in the hearts of his disciples the importance of putting the Lord first in all they do. And knowing that you will take care of us because you have wealth. We're not, we're not giving because you need it. And Father, I, I don't like those ministries that, that constantly cry out for money. If people aren't going to give with the right attitude. I don't want them giving at my church. I want them to to, to keep their money if they're just doing it to for some wrong, selfish reason or to look good. Father, I just want people to love you. And when they love you, I want them to be right with their giving. Help us, Father, to honor, honor this moment in the temple that you saw, that you watched, and to know 
that you are Lord and you are watching the giving today. It's not about what other people see. It's about what you see, Jesus, because you alone can see the heart. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that somebody watches this video and gets right before you now. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, my friends, that was a tough one. I hope that uh, no swears. Uh, okay, if you're going to email me or, or say something, uh, just be nice and, and we'll talk through it more. I'd love to have those conversations. I'd love to get your feedback. And I hope if you're in the area, you can come out to Journey. I would love to see you soon.